If you listen to arguments meant to convince you of evolution, you're likely to hear that DNA proves human evolution from apes. Now, these arguments might sound scientific to the uninitiated, but remember that these arguments are only philosophy-based opinions founded on the presumption of atheism. So if someone is trying to convince you that DNA proves evolution, remember that he's only exercising his imagination. There is no plausible pathway of evolution from apes to humans by looking at DNA. What I'm saying is you can't take the DNA of a human and an ape and then construct a line of descent based on mutations and natural selection. And by the way, you can't take the DNA of a chimpanzee and gradually modify it to result in something of higher intelligence. All you can do is look at the DNA of two isolated species and then speculate. And to do this, you have to imagine mathematical impossibilities. You have to imagine that DNA can be incrementally modified to a functional result. Listen to this statement by Richard Dawkins. I think perhaps the single most convincing fact, the observation that you could point to, would be the, um, the pattern of resemblances that you see when you compare the genes using modern DNA techniques, actually looking at the letter-to-letter -letter correspondences between genes, compare the genes of any pair of animals you like, uh, pair of animals, pair of plants, and then plot out the resemblances and they fall in a perfect hierarchy, a perfect family tree. And the only alternative to it being a family tree is that the intelligent designer deliberately set out to deceive us in the most underhand and devious manner. So you see in his own words, Dawkins is admitting that DNA is not scientific evidence. The only way that an argument can be mounted is to mock an alternative hypothesis, the existence of an intelligent creator. What Dawkins is doing is stating, look, I've looked at the DNA of different species and then I've disproven God, therefore you need to accept evolution by default. So what Dawkins is saying is that he can take the DNA of two isolated species and then show that God didn't create them. Therefore, you need to accept evolution by default. So the foundational arguments for evolution are based on deeply flawed logic, that you can disprove God and by so doing, prove evolution. So not only is DNA evidence a philosophy-based argument, it is based on scientifically illogical assumptions. It is assumed that if human life was intelligently designed, that its DNA would not be similar to a morphologically similar species. If humans and chimpanzees were intelligently designed, their DNA would be entirely different. This is their logic. In other words, evolutionists demand that scientifically illogical observations be found to prove that life was intelligently designed. So what they're essentially doing is challenging you to find evidence of magic. And if you can't, evolution has passed yet another test of falsification. And when they make these challenges, they pretend that this is scientific thinking. Now, the argument that DNA proves evolution is based on the idea that DNA was gradually modified over eons of time and that numerous mistakes were made along the way. Therefore, you can look at DNA and identify these mistakes and then logically infer evolution. Now, these imperfections in DNA are broadly categorized into three different areas. First, junk DNA, including things like pseudogenes and transposons, endogenous retroviruses, and chromosome 2 in humans. Now, these observations as being indicative of evolution are easily refuted. First, junk DNA. This is the claim that most of our DNA is useless, left over from an evolutionary past. Therefore, it wasn't intelligently designed, and therefore, it must have been through evolution. For example, Kenneth Miller stated, the human genome is littered with pseudogenes, gene fragments, orphan genes, junk DNA, and so many repeated copies of pointless DNA sequences that cannot be attributed to anything that resembles intelligent design. In fact, the genome resembles nothing so much as a hodgepodge of borrowed, copied, mutated, and discarded sequences and commands that have been cobbled together by millions of years of trial and error against the relentless test of survival. Now, two points need to be made here. First, notice that he's making a philosophical argument against intelligent design. And second, 
I'm going to point out that no one understands the language of DNA. No one is capable of looking at sequences and judging which are gene fragments, pseudogenes, discarded sequences, etc. So it's ridiculous to look at DNA and pretend to understand what is useless and what is meaningful. Now, this demonstrates the level of extreme arrogance that we're up against. This would be about like someone spending one week learning a few Chinese characters and then critiquing a Chinese novel. Kenneth Miller made this statement before it became widely recognized that the junk DNA paradigm has been scientifically refuted. Jerry Coyne made a similar statement about so-called junk DNA. He said, perfect design would be truly the sign of a skilled and intelligent designer. Imperfect design is the mark of evolution. We expect to find in the genomes of many species, silenced or dead genes, genes that once were useful but are no longer intact or expressed. These are called pseudogenes. The evolutionary prediction that we'll find pseudogenes has been fulfilled amply. Indeed, our genome and that of other species are truly well-populated graveyards of dead genes. Now notice here that Coyne makes again a philosophical statement about intelligent design. And then he makes the same mistake as Miller, assuming that he can determine which DNA sequences are functional and which are not. Now the problem with these arguments is that the junk DNA paradigm is false. Thousands of peer-reviewed articles have been appearing in the literature that document vital functionality of DNA sequences that were thought to be useless. And this illustrates why evolution is a hindrance to scientific discovery. In the case of junk DNA, it was assumed that a large portion of DNA was useless because it fit with evolutionary theory. But this junk DNA paradigm is now viewed as a false belief of the past. In fact, the molecular biologist John Maddox stated, the failure to recognize the full implications of this, particularly the possibility that intervening non-coding sequences, and here he's referring to junk DNA, that these may be transmitting parallel information, may well go down as one of the biggest mistakes in the history of molecular biology. Now for the second point, endogenous retroviruses or viral insertions. These refer to segments of DNA within the genome of humans and other species, which are similar to the DNA sequences of some retroviruses. Now, it's believed that these segments are the result of previous infections by viral parasites in the past, and they inserted their DNA into the germ cells of various organisms. And if we sequence the DNA of humans and apes, for example, we can see that similar sequences are seen in similar locations, hence descent from a common ancestor. Now, evolutionists argue that if we're not ancestral related to apes, this means that ancient viruses infected both lineages and coincidentally inserted their DNA exactly in the same places, which of course would be a mathematical impossibility. Now, the problem with this logic is that it presumes that homologous DNA sequences represent a past infection by a virus with insertion of its DNA, as opposed to simply representing another example of molecular homology. Now, I might point out that viral insertions are similar, but they're not identical to the DNA sequences of endogenous retroviruses. But in any event, this argument is refuted by the fact that many of these so-called viral insertions impart vital functionality to humans, particularly in placental development. So what I'm saying is that these sequences are simply an example of molecular homology. They are not from previous viral infections because if they were, they would be either harmful or have no beneficial effect. However, to hold on to the theory of evolution, evolutionists are proposing that a virus randomly inserted its DNA into the germ cells of a host. And this was initially useless to the host. However, it is believed that it was somehow preserved by natural selection so that over millions of years, it eventually imparted vital functionality to the host. Point number three, chromosome two. For those of you who aren't aware, chromosomes are the structures within cell nuclei that contain DNA. Modern apes have 24 pairs of chromosomes, whereas humans have 23. And if you look at the chromosomes closely under a light microscope, it appears that chromosome 2 of humans represents a fusion of chromosomes 12 and 13 in modern apes, and this is argued to be proof of common descent. Now it's important to realize that chromosomal shape and number is only reflective of how DNA is packaged. 
The nucleotide sequences of DNA are what determine traits, not the way DNA is packaged. And chromosomal fusions are not uncommon in human births. In fact, it happens in about one in 1,000 births. And most do not result in any functional impairment. There is no evidence that chromosome 2 in humans is not adequately functional. Now, humans and apes have similar DNA sequences, and there is no logical reason why a chromosome that appears to be fused wasn't intelligently designed. And if it is the result of an accidental fusion, that fusion might have occurred in an early human population that originally had 48 chromosomes. What's important to understand is that the nucleotide sequences of human chromosome 2 and of ape chromosomes 12 and 13 are similar. So chromosome 2 in humans is just another example of molecular homology, and this is a philosophical argument. It's often stated that DNA is proof of evolution in the same way that DNA is used as evidence in courts of law. This logic is reflective of a lack of understanding of the nature of DNA profiling. DNA evidence used in courts of law is based on analysis of a few specific nucleotides, and these sequences are known to vary from one person to the next as documented through birth records. And this is also reliant on the undisputed fact that all humans are known to be related by common descent. On the other hand, using DNA homology in humans and apes to prove evolution is based on homologous sequences that do not vary, and this is used to speculate common descent. Showing similarities between the DNA of humans and apes does not prove evolution. To demonstrate evolution, you need to be able to take the DNA of an ape and show how it could be incrementally changed through mutations. And this would need to be within the constraints of mathematical probability. The reason this is impossible is because millions and millions of units of genetic information would need to be simultaneously changed. If any of you haven't seen the videos I've created on mathematical challenges to evolution, I invite you to study these further. Remember, evolution is not science. DNA arguments for evolution appear scientific. However, they're ultimately founded on a philosophical worldview that wears a mask of science.